except to be a, a domestic, a laundress, a seamstress, or a proprietress of a boarding house, or a working girl. <laughs> do you ever long for adventure? Well, I sometimes do. I remember when Nevada was only a territory and not yet a state. Well, that was just a few short years ago, but the good times had yet to come to Virginia, including me. Oh, and those Pony Express riders, the adventures they had, the dangers they faced. I admit, I have a passionate fondness for one Pony Bob Haslam. He was the most famous of all the Pony Express riders, with the fastest time ever. Now that he works for Wells Fargo and Express Company, I do get to see him when he comes to town from time to time. Oh no, I've never met him. He rides into town, he rides out of town just as fast as he comes in. But if I ever got my hands on him, just what wouldn't I do? Now that's a real man. <laughs> now how come you don't have a bow? Pretty girls such as yourself, the thousands of men here on the Comstock, and you without a one of them? Choose wisely though, 
You wouldn't want to have to share him with someone like me. But then again, you wouldn't want someone like that miraculously ignorant Sandy Bowers, as Mark Twain once called him. <laughs> Do you know that his stuffy old wife actually thinks that I have eyes for her husband? I so enjoy watching her bristle like a porcupine every time I insinuate that I do. Now there's a saying. Nature, who has made the perfect rose and bird, has yet to make the full and perfect man. I don't know who said that, but it's true. Now I know there are there, those of you out there that do not approve of my use of laudanum. Why? It's not as if I'm addicted to opiates. Why, laudanum is very useful at keeping my headaches at bay and certain other discomforts. I tire of those hypocritical parlor cats who tout the evils of laudanum and opium as if whiskey were any better. Absolutely not. On more than one occasion, I have witnessed Dan DeQuill demoralized by his love of the drink. If the Territorial Enterprise readers ever knew how often his editorials were written by Alf Doton instead, when Dan couldn't make his way to the office the next day. And speaking of demoralized drinking, why that Brendan Timothy Michael O'Donovan, why he can put away whisker, whiskey faster than anyone I know. <clears throat> All right. <coughs> I know I was not really actually invited to this event, but I figure if you all can take my money, you can bear my company. <laughs> As I look around me at all of these women of society, culture, and wealth, I question, what is wealth? When one is wealthy, one could live the good and clean life. But is it always a clean road to wealth? I, for one, desire fine and pretty things, to be sure. But can I not also be wealthy in friends and admirers? I may not live in the grandest of homes or wear the finest of jewels, but I am I not also able to attend society events by way of operas and balls? I may not own 30 gowns, but I own several well-made and beautiful gowns that serve me and are not wasted in my closet. I've never really ever had to want for anything. I've always been clever enough to align myself with those who could provide for me adequately. Yes, my road from New Orleans to Virginia has had its bends and curves. Why, in San Francisco, I experienced such filth and debauchery I barely could stand it. Well, there, earthquakes and fires were a regular occurrence. And my business was in low-rent neighborhoods and boarding houses. The low fees I was forced to charge, I simply had to move on. Now, that's when I left for Weaverville. It was in Weaverville where things finally turned around for me. There I was sometimes paid in gold pieces as I had always dreamed. And I was considered a little more elevated than my counterparts. Well, it was in Weaverville where I was finally able to give back to my community. That is outside of my profession. <laughs> I would donate to charities and I nursed the sick from time to time, but it was a town that when things slowed down, one simply had to move on. So I left for Carson and then came here to Virginia. Now, dirt. Dirt depends on your point of view. How you deal with dirt and when you deal with it is up to you as well. Dirt washes off. I simply have reached the, ch the place where I have the freedom to make choices, and I am not ashamed of how I have obtained my wealth. Shame is a dirt more difficult to wash off than any other. Take that Bowers woman, for instance. <laughs> she thinks I should be ashamed of who and what I am. Why? I do for her friends' husbands what they would not because their moralistic upbringing has taught them to be ashamed of enjoying anything too much. Poor Mrs. Bowers. She probably will never know how much fun getting dirty can be. <laughs> <laughs> now, some folks like that wealthy Mrs. Bowers, so-called queen of the Comstock, think that material wealth gives one an exclusive right to enjoy culture and society events. 
It just tickles me to, turn, to see her turn pea green every time she finds me or my kind at an opera or ball. My escorts are her society, and sometimes her friend's husbands. <laughs> <laughs> she works tirelessly to bring culture and society to this godforsaken, lawless, crime-ridden, diseased, and debauched Wild West town. <laughs> All the while trying to keep the undeserving, such as myself, separate from her and her friends, only to find that she cannot control every aspect of life here on the Comstock. Why, you'd think she was going to catch syphilis from one of us every time she brushed near. <laughs> I ask you, how possible is it to bring culture and society to a town where everyone must arm themselves with a gun and bowie knife? And too much drink puts it to use far too often. Gambling and betting on anything that moves is a main attraction, to be sure. The majority of the citizens of this town have come here to work in a thankless death trap called the mines, day and night, night and day. The reality is, most won't ever see their families in the old states again. Lonely and violent men who drink too much, gamble too much, and cruise D Street too much. <laughs> a rough clay to mold into fine porcelain? Ha! I feel very fortunate to be able to travel in all circles of society. Well, maybe not all circles. There was that, that, in, that awkward evening when a miner, Doyle Harris, escorted me to the grand opening gala of the newly built Bowers Mansion. I declare, we were not there ten minutes before that Mrs. Bowers nearly came unwound. Under no circumstances was a working girl, prostitute, doxy whore going to muddy her fine marble floors. We were summarily tossed out, and back to Virginia we went. I didn't mind so much, however. We had more fun, just the two of us, anyway. Life isn't all about society. Why, I tend to the injured and sick working girls, and the miners as well. And I stand side by side with the boys of Virginia Company Number One as they fight the all too frequent fires that <coughs> plague this tinder box of a city. And I work hard at my profession. How much longer do I have before my hair turns gray and wrinkles map my face? For now, I do enjoy society events by way of attendant offers and balls. And I behave in a cultured manner as I was taught by my Uncle Jules. I read well and I'm aware of worldly issues, much more so than any of those old birds in their gilded cages up on A Street. <laughs> I do not play it light. I live it, and I keep my nose out of business that is not my own. That Bowers cow would do well to do the same. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was a time when I was 16, when my regard for family and morals was little to non-existent. I admit, I did not fully understand the importance of family. My desires fell upon the want of fine clothes, travel, and the flattery of men. Family? In my family, women married very young, bore many children, and then died of yellow fever like my own mother when I was very small. As a brilliant young quadroon, many folks call us mulattoes, what chance at refined society did I have? I saw my only fate as picking cotton and tending to the motherless children of my father and uncles. Why, it was my own Uncle Jules who set me up in business and taught me to be fluent in current affairs, literature and music, and worldly topics, all with a genteel approach as not to offend any gentleman. Dear, after after a while, my cousin Paul joined us. Jules was away attending to his affairs, and dear Paul was like a brother to me. Why, we traveled from San Francisco to Sacramento to the gold field mining towns near Angel's Camp. Later, we moved to Carson City. Paul came here to work at the Ophir Mine, and I stayed in Carson with my dear friend, Annie Smith. Annie is Hank Monk's girl. Why, my clientele were long ranchers, politicians of Carson Valley. Did I ever miss my home back in Louisiana? Well, distance does lend enchantment to the view. 
And I was all alone when tragedy struck, and poor <coughs> Paul was killed in a cave in at the Ophir. Well, after that, I could not face the world without the help of the laudanum. Laudanum soothes a multitude of grievances. And laudanum is also society's dirty little secret. There are as many or more laudanum users here in society as there are on the road. And family. Family meaning a faithful husband and sickly children. I declare, who here on the Comstock has an original family? Why, I have helped more of my friends bury their children than watch them take their first steps. If I ever met the right man who wanted to settle down with me, marry me, and bear his children. I would think about it hesitantly. Only Thomas Peasley has ever made me come close to want to be devoted to just one man. First fire chief in Nevada and foreman of Virginia Company Number no. 1. Abolitionist, Catholic, and strong unionist. While he was tall, rugged, and strikingly good looking, he had a seductive smile and penetrating blue eyes. We were hopelessly in love for the first time in our lives and we did give some consideration to marriage. While we never openly flaunted our relationship, it was widely understood that we were devoted to one another. It was Tom that after the violent death of my dear friend, Jesse Lester, he cheered me up by making me an honorary member of Virginia Company Number no. 1. Why, I had a new purpose in life and I took my appointment very seriously. After I learned the news that my dear Tom had been savagely attacked, violently murdered by his rival, Martin Barnhart, I was inconsolable. I could not attend his funeral and I lived in a stupor of brandy and laudanum for weeks. Aside from my love for Tom, I have never wanted to be a mother nor have I wanted to take care of another man's home while he ran around town with someone like me. <laughs> <laughs> Queen of the Comstock? No. I want to be remembered as Queen of Good Times. <laughs> well, it was on January 20th of 1967 that I would obtain that I would reach that status that I so desired, not that I would be around to enjoy it any. It, I owe it to the newspapers and the editors like my friend Alf Doton for their description of my brutal murder and my sensational life for such a grand turnout at my funeral. What led to it, however, is not to be recommended as a desirable road to fame. <laughs> or is it infamy? I never remember. It was a cold January night, and I had just the one customer, a miner, and after he left, I was, I was reflecting on the gifts my friend Annie Smith had given me that day, a watch Hank had given her, and a pair of earrings which needed repair. Now, as I began to dress, I heard my back door open, and then it slammed shut, and after that, what happened next is only a blur. I remember the struggle. I was pinned down on my bed, and I must have fought violently as I was bludgeoned twice on my head by my own piece of firewood. After that, my world swam away from me. I could not breathe, and my efforts grew weak. Finally, I gave in, and my life slipped away forever into the darkness. It was shortly after midnight January 20th of 1867, and I had just recently celebrated my 34th birthday. Now, as I lay there uh, departed from this world, I'll be damned if that blackguard did not run, but stayed on to rob me of everything that I had of value, all while my body grew cold just a few feet away. Isn't it ironic that in the end, my life was not worth a single penny. Now the good boys of Virginia Company Number no. 1 put on a wonderful funeral for me, paid for the entire affair they did. Why, flowers, a casket, and a hearse, and it was a grand turnout. 
while all, every man in Doxy was in attendance. <laughs> of course, the good, pious women of Virginia stayed home and shuttered their windows. They were incensed that anyone could celebrate my life, especially their own husbands. <laughs> well, no firemen minded contributing to the event. Of course, it was a year or so later when they were repaid. My very good friend, Mary Jane Minnery, was only able to collect $875 from my entire state, 64 of which was still owed beyond that. Granted, 149 of it would not have been necessary had I not needed to be buried. So, is that what my life was worth to my murderer? Around $800? And who was my murderer? If I saw his face clearly, I do not recall. John Millian claimed that he was a lookout for two gentlemen by the name of Douglas and Dillon, that he didn't even know I was murdered until the very next day. If so, what happened to these two gentlemen? And why did they not return to get my belongings back from Millian? Was it because of the immediate outcry for vigilante justice? Who knows? And what was Millian's life worth? A French-speaking foreigner who worked at odd jobs around Virginia. A mere shadow of the soldier who once fought in the Crimean War. If it is as Millian says, why would Douglas and Dillon need to need a lookout for the two of them. As I've said, I do not remember much, but I do not recall a second man in my room. Now, if Millian acted alone, was he really clever enough to plan an attack and a robbery, knowing that he would have to wait several months before he began to sell off my possessions? And regardless, how could he have ever imagined that my dresses and my one-of-a-kind jewelry pieces would not be recognized around the Comstock. Ironically, John Millian sat in a jail cell, charged with attacking another prostitute in a drunken rage when they charged him with my murder after they found my possessions in a trunk that he owned that he had stored with a friend of his. So there, in a jail cell sat Millian, awaiting a trial that would be over with before it began. You see, he did not understand very much English, and he was denied an interpreter. There was the circumstantial evidence of my belongings in his possession, that and his confession to at least being the lookout, but it seemed he did not have a friend on the Comstock. Well, except for his court-appointed attorney, Charles DeLong. Sadly, it would be over with before he knew it. But then, there were those good, pious women of Virginia. Disgusting lot. They showered him with gifts of food to praise him for my murder. <laughs> they were worse than any murderer why they would never get their hands dirty doing the deed, but they sure didn't mind somebody else doing it. Hypocrites, all of them. And the worst of the lot was that Bowers woman right at the beginning of the line with her sweet potato pies. <laughs> Whether or not John Millian was my murderer, he was doomed to hang for it anyway. As I said, he was a foreigner and the town was hungry for justice. He could not have had a better attorney than Charles DeLong. Yet he was sentenced to hang. And the good bells of Virginia Engine Company number one peeled out over the town in celebration of his conviction. Now, Charles DeLong did manage to keep him alive for just about one more year, taking the case all the way to the Nevada Supreme Court. But in the end, he was sentenced to die 1 o'clock p.m., April 24, 1868.
And if any town knows how to put on a fine hanging, it's Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Why, upwards over 3,000 citizens attended, from Chinatown to all of society. Families spread out their quilts and blankets and picnicked at this joyous event. Finally, Jean-Marie Avillain, his given name, you see, held his head high, climbed the gallows steps, and delivered his last words in this world. Sadly, most in attendance did not understand French, but I understood, and he was resolute to the end, that he was not my murderer, and he even said that he was not bitter at the, his lot in life and being a victim of the times in Virginia. It all took place in about, as, about the amount of time that it told me to tell you my story. So there you have it, mon chers. I did not mind leaving my world. Well, not so much anymore. But I can tell you this, I would have much preferred an overdose of laudanum to being <laughs> strangled and bludgeoned. <laughs> I do mind that Jean-Maria Villain was a victim of the times of Virginia. But old Eile Bowers got her due in the end. <laughs> she died deaf and blind in a poorhouse with less to her name than I had. Jean Mullane, Jean Marie and I speak of it often as we sit late afternoons on Flowery Hill. He never did like her sweet potato pies anyway. <laughs> <laughs> cemetery up there. She's relegated to some other place. Yes, and as a matter of fact, I, I intended to allude to that, and I lost it. Father, Father Minot presided over her graveside services on Flowery Hill at Flowery Hill Cemetery. That also hard press the good, pious women of Virginia to forgive him for such an infraction. But the Flowery Hill Cemetery, which you probably will learn more about today, a little later in a lecture, was saved for the undesirables and the people who would not are not good enough for the cemetery closer to town. Now today you cannot locate my grave. Maybe a few people might in secret know and they're sworn to secrecy. But in the 1950s, the good gentleman of E. Clampus Vitus decided to move my fence over to where it could be seen from the town as a nice tourist attraction. So I am buried there with Jean-Marie of Elaine, but our grave sites are lost to eternity. Except for those who know the secret, I will help you pin them down and tickle them. <laughs> are, there, are there any other questions for Julia Poulet? No questions. I could not have answered everything. Yes. How much of the history you just gave us uh, comes from actual knowledge? And, I mean, I know like we don't, but some of it's been lost over the years. So you have a question for Kim Coppell. I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would be happy to answer that. I, for I, you. Unless you don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to give away too many of your secrets. No, either. actually, it's not secrets. This is why I do what I do because I want to inspire people to to learn more about history and and to share it. And where um, I got roped into this by another friend, she got tired of watching me play Mail Pony Express Rider. <laughs> she wanted me to play a woman. So a prostitute, why not? <laughs> and um, s some of you know her, and she plays Eileen Bowers, so we actually wrote you know, an entire play around these two women who probably just you know, hated and despised each other. But what we did in the process, I think it took us six months that I remember, we researched everything we could get our hands on, even historic novels, for a flavor. 
And, and one thing that came out, a godsend for Julia Boulet. And I pronounce it Boulet, even though most of Virginia City says Boulet, is because of this research. A godsend, aside from the Nevada Historical Society, and I wasn't, in a, wasn't going to not mention it. At the time, I, didn't, I wasn't working with Arlene. Well, there was a book out by another author, and when he wrote it, um, he, he had you know, a certain amount of information, and he wrote what he knew. A woman by the name of Cece Hale, she's a, uh, she is a resident of, also of New Orleans and also of Lake Tahoe. And she spent, because she was intrigued because of the history back there, she spent 10 years researching Julia Boulay. Ships manifest, train manifest, uh, census records, family members that could have been um, related to her or were. When she found the ones that were, they provided her with documents, uh, letters, and diaries of family members. Okay, so they were able. To, she was able to trace her origins. She was born first. Um, first American. Uh, what am I trying to say here? If you don't have it memorized, it kind of goes. Um, <laughs> she was first generation American. Her, her mother and father were French, and she was a quadroon, which is what? No, it's not. It's one quarter African American, as we say today, and three quarters European, French or European. She was French. Um, uh, octagoon is one eighth. A mulatto is just generally, you know, an unknown mixture of, of you know, not necessarily European. So that's why she was not very uh, happy to be referred to as a mulatto, because a quadroon was society, and that is how her uncle Jules wanted to, to um, market her. And make no mistake, he was marking her as a prostitute, just an upscale one. And she was fine with that, because when she uh, started, you know, when she left for New Orleans from, she was born in Morehouse Parish in Louisiana. When she left with him, she got on a boat, and she saw all these courtesans and quadroons dressed beautifully. And again, she, you know, if she hadn't left home, she was going to be a babysitter and a cotton picker. And so she says, I want to be like that. And sure, there's, there's several women out there that, you know, it's okay. It, the, the sex thing isn't a big thing, but if it's a ticket to money and a fine life, and that, that's, that was the type of person she was. She was very precocious. So an, a long answer to your question, Susie, um, is that I, I, because Cece Hale had spent 10 years researching it. I didn't try to redo what she did. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I really saw, and she did explain in her book where she found the information, and so then I used that and um, Douglas McDonald's information, information that um, Arlene and the Nevada Historical Society had um, given to me, and it is a lot of first, um, what is it called, priority, what's the newspaper? Primary source. Primary source information that cannot lie, and newspapers, big, big, big. Plus, I also read every book on prostitution during that time that I could. <laughs> My local library will never invite me back. <laughs> I called up and asked for another one. They said it's lost. <laughs> so, uh, but that was to get the idea, to get the idea, because I have chosen, including Julia, I've chosen a total of four Chautauqua characters to portray that don't have anything, that don't have a lot of history on them. So, you, so in order to bring them alive for you, I have to kind of figure out how it would have worked and present in that light. Is there any other question for Kim Coppell? Yes. <coughs> well, I guess um, the, the disease, was it real prevalent in oh, Virginia yes. City? And what if I couldn't do anything, right? There was a lot of things that you couldn't do. There, there, a lot of diseases were treated by, you know, for women, you know, douching and with lye and things like that. It was just horrible. And yes, yeah, syphilis was a big one. You know, syphilis was a big one. That's why I chose to represent that. But there were lots of diseases. If you ever go to a museum that has, you know, a lot of, um, you know, a, a, a exhibit on the paraphernalia used, you know, in those days, um, just nasty looking stuff to try and take care of people with diseases. And it was, it was, it, that was, so was it a, a, going to be in a period of time it, it would be like, it would be just a, a matter of time before? Yes. Or luck? Uh, it will, not, there wasn't a lot of luck. Some, some of them were lucky. Um, for me, as a matter of fact, in, in part of the research I did, or Julia, uh, Julia's life, is in the, like December and January, she was visiting Dr. Green quite a bit. 
And Dr. Green, uh, ironically, ended up being, you know, was a coroner too, so took care of her body afterwards. <laughs> she was visiting him quite a bit. He was kind of trying to get her to get off the alcohol and the laudanum. But if she was going to him to be treated, it wasn't for that. So she probably had something. Because it was a matter of time. It was just a matter of time. So if she wasn't murdered, how many more years would she have lived? So these men were bringing it home to her family. Sure they were. Yeah. Mm. And some, some women were not having sex with their husbands because they knew where their husbands were. Oh, you know, they'd already married them, had the kids, that let the men go play, and then they weren't, they weren't doing anything. Mm. You know, it's Victorian times. Some of those women were taught that, you know, it, it, you're not a good girl if you have sex. And that's why these men you know, were going, you know, they weren't bad, no, they weren't bad men, they just had a need in their wives, you know, were trying to be Victorian, mm -hmm. you know. Yes? Um, is your other character, Charlie Parker, yeah. and um, is the way contemporaries, or no? They could have uh, passed, they could have known each other, let me think really quickly, no, no they wouldn't, because Charlie was out of, um, Charlie Parker's was out of Virginia City by the time Julia showed up. They, yeah, maybe they could have um, crossed paths, but it wouldn't have been significant. Charlie Parker's was a contemporary of Hank Monk. And Hank Monk, the famous stagecoach driver, was a good friend of Julia's, by way of Julia's good friend, Annie Smith. Yes? I had one more question about the murder. Um, is there any other suspects, or was he just the person? That yeah, yes, there was, and I, you know, if you guys didn't want to sit here for three hours, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I meant, <laughs> I'm, I'm so big on history. I should. Yeah, no, no, I'm glad you asked. That's what this is for. No, they'll cut me off when they want to get me out of here. But um, no, I, 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 don't take me wrong. It's just that's why I love the question part of it because you just can't fit everything in without it turning into a lecture. Yes, there are other suspects. Remember, I mentioned. Um, uh, my dear friend, um, or, or uh, the murder, or the violent death of my dear friend, Jesse Lester. Mm -hmm. Jesse Lester was attacked by, um, I can't remember, if he went by Chris Christensen, uh, Christian something Crittenden, I can't, I, I've lost the name right at this moment, but she, she was attacked by him, mm -hmm. and um, he cut her so badly that they had to amputate her arm, and she died from that. She died, she never recovered. And so um, he was on the loose, and Thomas Peasley, who was alive at the time, and Julia and a few of the other people, I think Cat Thompson was one of them, managed to get him brought in and convicted, and he was in prison. In th those days, you didn't serve a long time in prison. Mm -hmm. He had just gotten out around that January, early January, so they thought he could have done it. They, uh, you know, then there was the Douglas and Dylan, and then um, they thought that a rival of Thomas Peasley might have come back, and that was kind of that was kind of a long stretch. But they, they like met right away, and they were going to go hang somebody, <laughs> and and it wasn't you know they didn't find anybody until simultaneously. Here goes Millen or uh, uh, Millian, yeah, because because believe it or not, somebody transposed his, his name when he started writing it down because it is Jean Marie Avelaine but it is John Millian, so somebody screwed it up, and that's you know hard for me to remember. But it was when he started shopping her stuff around Gold Hill that oh. Annie Smith's um, sister recognized the watch and went, and then there was a dress pattern and things like that. And so just about the time everybody was going to come in and tell on him, they found him in jail. He had just been arrested for you know just for attacking a woman. So they. Hell, they had their guy. Why look any further? <laughs> you know, that's the new yes. um, The clothes, were they from Paris to trends? Were they from <coughs> Was there a lot of competition that's with the women like there is today? Yes. Yeah, to see things. And very stuff. good question. Um, Julia, the one I want to point out is that she only had 800, her, her, her valuables were only worth $875. She had a little bit of money under her bed, but she didn't. You know, the, the whole thing about her being wealthy, she was able to be more benevolent at times, but she you know, she fared better than the prostitutes that, that either were, you know, really right out there on the streets or ones that worked for, like, you know, Cad Thompson or whatever who would take, or had pimps who would take part of the money. She could afford to rent her own place, but she didn't have a lot of money because she had a, a taste for good look, for clothes and nice things. She always had. Remember, you know, when she was 15, so she would buy a lot of these things, but, but some of the prostitutes would align themselves with the local mercantile stores, and when a new dress pattern would come in for, you know, for the model, 
Well, Julia really was five foot two, and she's got 18 inch waist. I'm a far cry from that. But those dress patterns would fit her and some of the other ladies quite often. So she had very nice clothes, and she could buy them reasonably. Um, there was a lot of competition. Also, I the question hasn't come up yet, and I, I tell you, I don't know. I've never seen a monetary amount for what she made. But I'm sure she made better than some of the others. Plus, if some people couldn't afford to pay, they would give her something nice. So a lot of her things did come as gifts. Mm -hmm. Or she had from better days, like in Weaverville, you know, or New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there was competition, and she always dressed. She never went out of the house, you know, underdressed. So she had nice things. But, you know, it, it, she didn't have an estate or anything like that. Were there any other questions? Yes. Who were your other characters that you've studied? Oh, that I, that I play? Um, well, I started out with Warren Upson, Pony Express rider, and he rode from Sportsman's Hall in Pollock Pines um, all the way to Genoa at first, and then later just to Lake, just Lake Tahoe. Um, I also portray, besides Julie Boulette, Boulet, oh, I'm getting confused. Um, <laughs> I portray Lillian Virgin Finnegan, who was the originator of the Genoa Candy Dance. And then I portray oh. Charlie Parkhurst, who was a stagecoach driver. And um, I was, my biggest fear today was to come in here and start, um, to start out as Julia and end up as Lillian. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that wasn't going to work well. <laughs> yes? Uh, is it known if she ever kept a list of her clientele? I, nobody has found one as far as I know. Because it hasn't turned up as, as far as I know. Maybe there was a list and... Uh, Somebody had it and it was lost to time, or or nobody knew eventually who whose it belonged to. You would think she might, wouldn't you? Yeah. You would think she might. Oh, excuse me, just hold this one, and I'll get you. Yes. Um, do you know if there was use of condoms? In that time? Yes, there was, but they weren't very reliable. They were made from like um, um, sheep intestines or yeah. animal intestines. Yeah. So you know, it still would feel good, but it wasn't too you know durable. And so that wasn't the best method to go. But in the trade, they would use. Yes, they would use that. And they, they, um, there were some other things, and I can't, I don't want to describe those. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, they did use one. Yes. How long does it take you to get the information and become the character? How? This how one took about six months, and then I opened my big mouth, <laughs> and I was asked if I could do a, a do something today, and I'm thinking. Yeah, Charlie Parker's not scary. You know, <laughs> Lily Virgin, definitely not scary. Um, and uh, Warren Upson, not scary. So I thought, oh, you know what? I was going to start going into um, the murder and the controversy around it. And so I thought, well, that would fit today. So um, to add the million information, um, I, I'm moving right now and doing other things, and I kicked it in gear and literally just finished memorizing it like Monday. Oh. <laughs> so if you saw me kind of, you know, stop there, it was like, I, you know, thankfully I have a photo, not a necessarily photographic memory, but I see, I see my paragraphs, and I just had to see where I was, you know. But that, this one, I kicked it in gear because I didn't have anything scary or dark or, you know, this time of year, yeah. Yes? Have you thought about working with Sandy to find the grave? Uh, yeah, well, we can. We, ha we would have to get an ATV up there, and Sandy's as busy as I am, so we have kind of talked about that. But we have to get, you know, hike up there and get an ATV to get up there because there's no longer a road. But that would be quite interesting, wouldn't it? And it, yes. Where did she live, and is it still in existence? It is not still in existence, but we know where she lived. Union Street, if, if you're right there on C Street and Union Street, it'd be the north be on the north side, so that was the Fredericks building, and that was, you know, it had different things in there at different times, but it was a hotel and probably a little bit of a prostitution, you know, off uh, place. And then when you go down the street, you would take a left on D Street and go in, and on the northeast side of the street, you would go in maybe two or three buildings. It used to be an old shoe shop, and she was able to rent it. It was just two, it was just two rooms. So she would bathe and have her bathe at her friend Gertrude's and have her friend Gertrude, you know, fix her breakfast and dinner. She wasn't much into, you know, cooking. And so it, it that and the Fredericks building and Cad Thompson's brick house, all that stuff disappeared in 1875 with the big fire. So, but that's where it was. And there's still some crypts down there that you can see some examples that have been moved around. But that's where she lived, yeah. 
Any other questions? Well, you know what? Thank you all for coming here today and sitting in this room and listening to me. Hi, I'm Michael Smith for uh, Shop Talk, and I have a very great show today. I have author Sandy Lanay, and she has a new book called Weird Reno. Um, you usually write, write uh, books about psychics and haunted places, and now you're doing Weird Reno, and with prospects of doing Weird Virginia City and Weird Carson City. Yes. Uh -huh. So are you going in a whole new direction here, or are you going to... Uh, change your methods or this is just, just kind of a fun break? This is just kind of a fun break, I think, yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's a great idea because what, uh, I haven't read the book, but I've kind of perused it, is people absolutely love trivia. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you've nailed it right dead mm -hmm. on what people like. It's just weird things. Uh -huh. So if you, weird is good. Weird is very good. And you have to be weird to write it. <laughs> I practice. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if you have to be weird, but you have to be able to have the perception to think, hey, that might be a funny story or that mm -hmm. might be funny. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, when I was at the um, History Museum, I met your, uh, your partner in crime. Yes, yes. Arlene LaFerry and I have this. Was, it was a concept by her, and I wrote the book. And um, how it got started was actually kind of an interesting story. We're both on Facebook. And um, she found something, because she's always researching, and she found something about some bones in a, uh, in a safe deposit box. Bones in a safe deposit yeah. box. What would you possibly do to that... save bones for? <laughs> <laughs> well, what it was, it was for a case way back, way back when. And I told her, I said, that would make a fun book. You know, all these interesting little tidbits and trivia and inter interesting pieces of history. I said, that would be kind of a fun book, a weird book. And she said, well, I'll research the stuff if you want to write it. And I said, okay, let's go for it. And then it just took on a life of its own. So, uh, so once you find bones in a safety deposit box and you find out why, do you, do you go further with the story to kind of give people with the, some yes. of that? And what the reason why? And oh, I was going to say you have to get the book to oh, find no, out no, no, why. No, 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 no. I want to save my money. <laughs> no, no, but that's that's like I said, it's good trivia because because uh -huh. don't you pay money for a safety deposit box? You have yes, to, you do. You know, um, I, I, mean, I don't I don't have one myself, but mm -hmm. you'd have to maintain paying it. And did it someone like skip out on the bill? And they well, actually, and, it, they they found it in a safety deposit box because there was a court case going on. And that's where they had to kind of keep the bones for a while. Okay. So, yeah, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, so get the book and get the bones. Uh, no, no bones about it. No bones about <laughs> it. But now this book is really interesting because there is historical anomalies. <laughs> there's interesting um, trivia. There's funny things. There's comical things uh, from Reno from the mid-1800s to present day. Now, when you go back that far, are you going back through... Newspapers? Newspapers, uh-huh, and uh, court cases. Court cases? And um, legends, okay? People have brought down their stories from other books, uh, their families. Okay. So it's like family le legends type thing? Or uh -huh. is it from like the people who settled in Reno and created Reno, or is it just... Uh... Yes, it's about that. Uh, there's a section in here about gaming 
and about the corruption in gaming when that first started. Corruption in gaming? I never heard that. I know. I said, yeah, that's news, isn't it? <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> right, yeah. And those but girls were always you know, crooked? <laughs> they were. They were. Boy, I learned a lot about Reno in the early days. In the 1800s and uh, 1890s, um, up into the 1950s, a lot of interesting things in there. Well, they had a lot of games of chance. I, I kind of remember some history stories where people come in on the, the wagon train and they lose everything they had before they got even farther west. Yes, yeah, that's and, uh, true. And so you found amusing things, I hope, the positive stuff. Oh, you bet. There's a lot <laughs> of comical things in here, too. There's uh, sections about uh, famous animals, famous. like Bertha and Tina. Bertha and Tina. Bertha and Tina, yeah. From the John Esquagus Nugget. The elephants. Oh, they're elephants. Yes, I, mean, I, was they're elephants. Try, I was thinking of a bird. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a psychic. <laughs> right. Well, there's there's people in there, too, about Eile Bowers. She was a seer. And she's uh, in here, too. Did she have elephants? She didn't have <laughs> elephants, but she had a peep stone, which is a crystal ball. Awesome. Yeah. So there's all kinds of trivia in here. It was a, it was a fun and funny book to write because of just the interesting things that both Arlene and I researched. So what did you like, how would you, how would you research? I mean, that's a hard thing to research. You had to go through all these newspapers to find something that's this uh -huh. quirky? Uh, sure, but now, like there's a section in here of famous people that were born. Um, Most noted, people are born. Well, I mean, in Reno. <laughs> <laughs> Noted people. There's uh, some interesting things in here about some of the uh, political figures. Awesome. No wait blackmail, wait, wait. though. Wait, 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 wait. Now, is this from like the 1800s? You're getting some quirky things about the guys from the 1800s because that was before the girls. No, well, I, yeah, we've even got the the working ladies of the evening in there. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so all kinds of trivia, all kinds of fun things, interesting things. There's even ghosty stories in here too. Oh, you do have ghosts. Uh-huh, we do have ghosts. We have psychics. So that's kind of right up my alley it's too. It's a beautiful book. Weird Reno. Mm -hmm. Is that the name you decided to pick out or is it like a mutual uh -huh. or Darlene do it? Uh-huh. Oh, no. We just kind of, well, we kind of threw ideas back and forth and we thought, why not have something, you know, just very strange, not just like weird things that happen in Reno or, or interesting things or strange things, just weird Reno. Well, wasn't this book something to do with the historical museum? I remember you mentioned something about the historical society that it, they was put yes, there or something? Yes, I'm very honored about this. When this book was published, I was asked by the Nevada Historical Society if they could put this book online in their database as primary source, as cited works. It's like, yay. Well, that's awesome. What an honor well, that's a, to that's have a, That's a major book. deal. Yes, so that, it that is. That says it's, it's this historic book. Yes, it is. And it's accurate. It's accurate. Well, the bibliography, book. it's like, what, seven pages in this? Yeah. Thing. Well, I've read all your, well, most of your books, and you, you're a very accurate person. You, know, you double-check your double-checks. Yes, I do. Um, I don't believe in cutting and pasting. I believe in looking up the facts. If I have three different stories, I'm going to find out which one is the truth and, and accurate. I've met Arlene, and I know that she's the kind of person that would look at a, a penny on three ways. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Heads, tails, and outside, because mm -hmm. she, 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 she knows everything. Sure. And oh, she's, she's she, great. She is really good, so you should go to the Historic uh -huh. Museum in, in, uh, in Reno and talk to her. Cause oh, yeah. If you want anything researched, your families, uh, your ancestry, or, or just interesting pieces of, of well, <laughs> history, go to Arlene LaFerry. She's the best. Well, how long did it take you to, to work on this book? There's a lot of stuff. Um, let's see. Usually a book will take me four to five months. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, we, we decided to, like you said at the beginning of the interview, to have a trilogy. We're going to have Reno, Weird Reno first, and then we're working on Weird Virginia City, and then we're going to have Weird Carson City. So there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, interconnected stories. Like in here, there's a story about the trains. Weird for, trains? Weird trains, yes. <laughs> I've been to the train museum. They're pretty weird. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that, are the trains. <laughs> yes. The people that run them. No, no. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're neat people, but the they trains are. are fun. They are. Well, they'll be interconnected because Carson City, Virginia City, and Reno, we kind of had some connecting lines. We're all kind of mm -hmm. the same, you know, big region. Yeah. yeah. So we have this, this trine of the three major um, well, cities of the time, towns of the time. Well, so, when you, now you're talking about Virginia City and, mm -hmm. and Carson City. Well, is the 
historical museum database able to get those two, or do you have to change like libraries to look for more research? And well, we do look for the archives. Mm -hmm. So you go to Virginia City now to get uh -huh. that? Sure, yeah. Which, well, they have a lot of at the uh, Historical Society. Okay, good. Well, I've seen that room. It's a big mm -hmm. room. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. And thousands and thousands of pieces of information. And then, like with me, with my research for my books, uh, I live in Carson City, and I like to write historical, paranormal, historic, uh, um, hello, books about particular places in town. I will go to the archives here in town and look up their information, tax records, things like that. So once you find a, a quirky fact, then you how do you double check the quirky fact from besides the newspaper? Well, just other accounts of it. If so there's you, like two or three different newspapers and they all have the same account, then you know the same time frame, the same day, the same information, then we know that it's pretty well accurate. Okay. Yeah. So I'll throw out some more weird stuff. I'm I'm still kind of curious about what the definition of weird is. <laughs> oh, well, let's see. I have to look at my own book here. We've got chapters on, uh, like, transportation. Transportation can get about, pretty weird, uh -huh. you know, because of all the technical changes. Too. Sure, because we started out, like, with the, the wagon trains and then the automobile, the trains themselves. Uh, we have, I've got gangsters. Gangsters and, uh, can get weird, uh -huh. just the clothing alone. Yeah, well there's an interesting uh, chapter in here, of, I think I put it under the gangsters, about when um, uh, Frank Sinatra's son was kidnapped. Well that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. well, we're down to our last two minutes mm -hmm. on Shop Talk. Oh. <laughs> can you go out and give information on how we can buy or purchase your book or where to you you bet. Know, get a hold of it? You bet. You can purchase this book at my website which is www.sandypsychicstones.com. Um, there's going to be different bookstores around town like Morley's Books, uh, Evergreen Jean Incorporated. They, they carry the books that you can buy them there too. No, it's uh, back to the uh, Historical Society. Can you purchase a copy there too? Not yet. We're just we're getting we're getting um, what would you call it a contract fixed up so you can buy them at the Nevada Historical Society. Okay, so I have a little bit of time left. Give us another weird topic. Oh, a weird topic. Well, let's see. We've just got all kinds of fun and weird. Um, well, there's laws. Well, laws can okay. be pretty weird. Now you know that it is illegal to drive a camel down the highway. What? But in is the that late, Virginia City? <laughs> in the in the 1870s, you could. <laughs> oh. well, Virginia City has them racing around town. I guess they, that's just, right. That's why they have to make they make them go into a track now. <laughs> that's right. They well, were that's, a pack animal. Well, that's that's pretty you. weird. Uh huh. So there's all kinds of fun trivia things like that inside this book, Weird Reno by Sandy Lene and the concept by Arlene LaFerry. Well, go check it out and help our local uh, authors uh, survive and. It's been Michael Smith for Shop Talk, and enjoy the book. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm pretty weird, too. <laughs>